welcome to another episode of Search News You Can Use with me, Dr. Marie Haynes. I think you're going to really like this episode. I've been studying sites that were impacted by September's core update, and I came across some really interesting things. I've put together this theory. I think so far, the biggest thing that changed with the September core update is Google got better at assessing whether a searcher's needs have been met. So we're going to explore that in this episode of Search News You Can Use. I'm telling you, if you can grasp what I'm saying here, I really feel like as an SEO, you're going to be ahead of the game. There's a lot of changes that Google's been making that are hard to explain. But after uh, I get all of this information out that's in my head right now, I think it's going to make a lot more sense. There are very few posts that are written so far about analyzing the September core update. Lily Ray, my good friend, has uh, an excellent post where she's looked at the winners and losers, and she's come up with a, a little bit of her uh, thoughts on what was actually impacted at this time. I know Lily talked about certain types that were of sites that were hit, like news sites were hit. Uh, a lot of government sites saw improvements. A lot of music sites were up. Uh, dictionary sites were down. And Lily theorized that these were related to Google understanding different intents. So for dictionary sites, it may be that Google recognized, you know, when people search for this query, they're not uh, as likely to be looking for a dictionary definition, but rather they want a different type of content. And so when Google understands a different intent, that can be impacted in, in uh, can show, the impact can show in a, a core update. Um, Morty Oberstein has uh, an excellent article as well, where he talks about uh, some of the things that we could uh, say about the September core update. He says that maybe uh, it's not as volatile as the May core update and different stats but really there's nothing that anybody's produced that says, look, if you were hit, this is what you have to do. And I get that because it's a new update. We haven't uh, analyzed, uh, we haven't seen sites that have recovered because we're going to need to wait until another core update happens to see recovery. But to me, this update feels different than other core updates that we've had. This is probably a good place for me to actually mention our sponsor for this episode. I'm just going to briefly say that you should probably consider listening to Morty Oberstein and Crystal Carter's podcast for Wix. It's called Wix's Serps Up Podcast. And if you enjoy the things that I'm talking about, you're really going to enjoy the guests that they have as well. You can find it wherever you can get podcasts or uh, Wix has a learning hub at wix.com slash SEO slash learn and you can get the podcast there. Um, so I haven't seen many people writing their thoughts on the September core update other than some statistics about what changed, uh, but really not a lot of advice on recovery. And and so I'm going to explain in this episode my theory on what Google changed here. If you're new to listening to podcasts, because I know I've been getting a lot of new listeners recently, which thank you, welcome. I'm glad that you enjoy uh, hearing me babble about Google. My name is Dr. Marie Haynes. I used to be a veterinarian many years ago and then got really, really obsessed. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with trying to understand how Google's algorithms work. Uh, but for the last, uh, gosh, 14 years now, I've been obsessing over every little change that Google has made. Now, my theory for the last few updates, the last few core updates, is that Google has been doing more and more to introduce machine learning in these updates. And this is really, really important. Uh, you know, people kind of gloss over it. I was tweeting a little bit about it this week, and I feel like nobody is really getting what I'm trying to say here. So hopefully I can explain it in this episode. So we know that Google wants to present searchers with content that meets their needs. I mean, if you think of how we search, uh, the, the searches that we do looking for information, well, we're really looking to accomplish something. Either we're looking to find a particular business, or if we're looking for information, we usually want to find it quickly. You know, I might be sitting watching football with David and uh, and saying, oh, yeah, remember that guy? Didn't he get into this accident a little while back? And then I start, uh, you know, doing a search for the football player to figure out what this accident was. Well, what I'm looking for is probably not the most thorough, comprehensive article that explains the accident. What I'm looking for is to quickly find the information that I was lacking 
and to be able to share that with the person that I, I, I was talking to. Um, and what I see with the September core update is that more and more sites that are able to get users to their answer quickly are the ones that Google is promoting. I had a conversation recently with Alan Kent from Google. If you missed it, I'll link to it. Uh, you can find it also on YouTube and in, uh, in the back episodes of my podcast, uh, where we talked about machine learning. We talked about how uh, Google may be using machine learning to determine which content answers the product review questions that they gave us. And I'm going to be presenting in a lot more detail at SMS SMX Next, which is mid-November. I'll again leave a link where you can sign up for that. It's a free uh, conference for SMX. Um, about how I believe Google is using machine learning to create these algorithms. And as SEOs, we really need to be paying attention to them. I was reading in preparing for this episode, Google's How Search Works documentation. They have a whole section in this documentation about how Google ranks websites. And I noticed something that I had not noticed before. Now, this has been there since the document was published. It was first published in August of 2021. And Google says in this, they talk about how they use, uh, they match keywords on in queries with keywords on pages. This is something that we know that Google has done in their search algorithms for, for you know, since the beginning of Google search, we're trying to find content that is relevant. And a good start is to say, uh, is this keyword actually seen on the page or a synonym of, of this keyword seen? And then Google goes on to say, beyond looking at keywords, our systems also analyze if content is relevant to a query in other ways. We also use anonymized interaction, or sorry, we also use aggregated and anonymized interaction data to assess whether search results are relevant to queries. To me, this is a really big deal. Uh, if Google is using aggregated and anonymized interaction data, uh, it's something they can use in machine learning. Uh, and so Google says, we transform that data into signals that help our machine learn systems better estimate relevance. Now, that's nothing new. We know that Google wants to present people with the most relevant uh, information, but I do think that something has changed. In Google's documentation on what site owners need to know about core updates, they tell us if you were impacted by a core update, there's two areas that you need to focus on. One is content and the other, and then they give all these questions that we can ask ourselves. I'm going to go over a couple of these questions in a minute. And the other is to get to know the Raider guidelines, the quality Raider guidelines and EAT. And if you've been following me, you know that, that I've talked about that extensively. I have many, many talks on EAT and on how we can get information from the quality Raider guidelines to improve our SEO strategy. Well, most of the SEO world, a lot of the SEO world, I think, uh, when we talk about EAT, they they focus on just two of Google's core update questions that they give us. Uh, Google gives us this list of questions to say, you know, if you were impacted, maybe you should consider this. And two of the questions talk about expertise. So one is, does the content present information in a way that makes you want to trust it, such as clear sourcing, evidence of the expertise involved, background about the author or site that publishes it? Um, and then the next question that uh, also covers expertise is, is this content written by an expert or enthusiast who demonstrably knows the topic well? So these can be important in Google's ranking systems, but they're not the only thing. And I think a lot of people are missing the boat when we're talking about EAT. I'm going to share some examples in a minute uh, where I think that needs met is actually being seen as more important than EAT for certain queries. So in the same document, Google tells us that what we need to do is get to know the quality raters guidelines. And there are two things that the raters are supposed to do. There's a document that I keep referencing where they talk about how the quality raters work, uh, who the raters are, how their work is used, and they break it down into two areas that the raters are supposed to assess. One is page quality, how well the page achieves its purpose. And uh, this is really synonymous with EAT. A couple of years ago, in the QRG, one of the rewrites, they actually changed a lot of the places where they mention EAT. They changed the wording to say page quality. So EAT and page quality are somewhat synonymous. Um, 
And I think uh, the next most important thing, though, because, you know, we've been talking about how do you identify if your content, maybe your searchers want to see content that's written by an expert author, or uh, perhaps uh, they expect to see content that only comes from the highest authoritative sites. Uh, and that's where EAT plays a role. Uh, but what if, um, you know, all these sites have, uh, Google has a bunch of sites where they meet the threshold of EAT, of real world experience, or uh, being recognized as being no knowledgeable on a topic, if they've met that, then the next thing that quality raters are told to look for is needs met. How useful a result is for a given search. And the raters are told to determine the user intent and then give the page a rating to see how well it meets those needs. Now, I've talked about uh, this in the past where the quality raters guidelines have a whole section on whether content fully meets the needs of searchers. And this is really, really important. This should be our goal as SEOs is to make it so that when a searcher lands on our content, they're like, all right, I got what I came here for. Uh, I don't need to look at any other pages. And if you can accomplish that, you have a much better chance of ranking well. So let's go back to this idea of Google using aggregated and anonymized interaction data. That could be the information from the quality raters. So the quality raters could be labeling which pages are helpful and unhelpful. And then Google also has data from live tests. Now they don't tell us how much that they're using this, uh, but uh, I believe that they're using data from clicks who clicks on certain uh, pieces of uh, content that are seen in the search results. And if that's happening, they can combine those two things. The quality raters are saying, look, here's what's synonymous with quality. Uh, the live data is showing, you know, here's the pages that people tend to click on and engage with. I talked in the past, uh, Cyrus Shepard mentioned some patents that talk about uh, how Google could use click data. Uh, if a user, in some cases, if a user does not do any more searches, that could be indicative of uh, their needs being met. And this could be a sign to, to measure. And so Google can use this information in machine learning algorithms to basically figure out uh, what are the factors that make a page important important for this query that make a page helpful is probably a better way to say uh, that for, for this particular query. So it seems to me that the September core update, the one consistent finding, because I've looked at a lot of pages that uh, improved at the time that clients that come to me are uh, were investigating drops. And it, the one consistent factor is that the pages that improved always seem to do a better job at quickly getting the searcher to their answer. So as SEOs, this is really hard to evaluate because I find that we can look at these pages and as an SEO, we could say, but look, my client has expertise and my client has the most substantial content that exists on this topic. Uh, it's got everything under the sun uh, that is connected to this topic. And perhaps that's good for some searchers, but if searchers are just looking to get their answer quickly, it may not be as important to have all of the content. It's important to know what's important to users and do you show them that in a, in a quick and easy, concise way. So I want to look at a couple of examples that uh, some people sent to me on Twitter. Uh, this is going to be something I'm going to do a little bit of screen sharing. If you're listening to an audio version of this podcast, I'm going to do my best to make it so that uh, you can still understand what's happening without the screen sharing. This first example was sent to me by my good friend, Melissa Fash. Melissa was pointing out something that a lot of SEOs are saying is that Google is ranking things, you know, if EAT really matters, then how can Lending Tree rank for the cost of an oil change uh, higher than a site like Kelly Blue Book that actually has expertise in automobiles. And so I want to share with you what I think is happening here. Uh, and I think this is an excellent example to do this. Uh, so let's actually search for how much an oil change costs. Um, here's a little tip if you're searching outside of the US, uh, this is a great site how you search from to help you do a US search. And uh, now I see Lending Tree ranking number one here too. Now, uh, I was going through this example with a strategy call client uh, earlier this morning. And uh, actually, Kelly Blue Book was ranking number one. So, you know, who who knows if you see the same thing as I do. But I think this will still help explain why I think Google uh, sometimes ranks a site like Lending Tree that's lacking EAT for automobiles for this query. Um, 
so first of all, take a look at the uh, the featured snippet. It really tells me everything that I need to know. So if I put myself in the shoes of a searcher, who's doing this query? It's basically somebody is sitting at home going, oh, I need an oil change. What's that going to cost me? They pick up their phone and do a search. How much is an oil change? Uh, and this tells me I'm going to be paying 20 to $60. Uh, you know, um, if I take my vehicle, they're going to charge me for a variety of items. I think this is important too, according to prices advertised on major realtor retailers. Lending Tree is saying, look, here's the answer. Here's how we can back that up, where we got the answer from. And then Google also pulls out some more interesting information from their site. Now, let's take a look at Kelly Blue Book here. And uh, I like to look at the mobile version because Google uses a mobile first index. Probably most people doing this query are going to be searching on their phone. And if I just want to know how much an oil change is, I have to scroll a bit. I don't even know where it is on the page. I'm going to maybe do a control F and search for dollar sign. There it is. It's it, it's in the comments section. So now let's go back and look at some of these other pages that are actually ranking well. For the person who has this question, how much does an oil change cost? The answer is very clearly front loaded in this article. It's bolded. It's really easy for me to get the answer that I'm searching for. And they go on to do even more. Now this is in highlighted in purple because it was the featured snippet. That's what Google pulled for the featured snippet. But look at this. This is really what people are looking for. You're basically saying like, oh, I'm going to run down to Walmart for an oil change and I can expect to pay $30. That's actually doing a really good job at meeting the needs of searchers more so than Kelly Blue Book. Uh, and I think if we go back and look and see, uh, NerdWallet does a very similar job. Oh, I'm going to sign in. I can see it's going to cost 20 to to $100. Like I get the answer that I'm looking for. And if we go to the next site that actually has EAT, so car and driver, obviously Google's ranking system uh, put this site uh, in this con content in the SERP because they have EAT for talking on car things. It's telling me it's going to be a number of factors. Blah, blah. I See, I can't find it. It's not okay. It varied from 71 to 84. Okay, that might be an answer. So it, it's hard. I need to read this whole article in order to get the answer that, uh, that I searched the question for. Does this mean that um, it doesn't matter to have EAT? That it doesn't matter to have expertise? I think that it's all weighted in the algorithm. And Google uses machine learning to figure out, well, what's important for this query? It, it may be helpful to have expertise in, in relation to autos. That's why Kelly Blue Book was, was ranking there. Uh, but what's most important here is to have like fairly accurate information that a user can find quickly. And so that is likely what was weighted higher in this algorithm. So I want to look at another example. This example was sent to me by Vlad Rapoport. And Vlad runs a, a couple of different sites. This one is, this is actually, you know, pretty good content. I think it does a good job at meeting searcher needs, but I'm going to show you something. He shared with me uh, a competing site that doesn't look as high quality, uh, that's ranking uh, better than him, especially since the September core update. And so I want to share my thoughts on this. Now, I haven't analyzed the situation completely, but here's what I think. So this is Vlad's page. And if I was a searcher looking for information on whatever the supplement is, this AG1 supplement, there's certain things that are going to be important to me. And I really like how, uh, you know, Vlad has made this page very, uh, it looks aesthetically pleasing to, to searchers. I think this is fantastic, listing the pros and cons. As a searcher, I can be like, all right, okay, so what do I need to know about this supplement? I mean, clearly people who did this search have heard about this supplement and are trying to decide, is this something that I should buy? So Vlad can tell me the pros, that it's it's convenient, it's packed with vitamins, it's third-party tested. The cons are, uh, you know, it's hard to tell how much of it, each ingredient is there, okay? There's one or more, it, there's a, a expensive, it's an expensive product and it might cause gas and bloating. All right, well, that tells me stuff. I'm going to keep scrolling because searchers don't read. They don't read entire paragraphs. Now, there are some types of searches where maybe somebody wants to read a full article, uh, but here, okay, what is it? I can determine what it is. It's going to give me this many calories. It's dairy-free. All right, all that great stuff. How do I take it? So I'm going to 
mix it. And so I'm, I'm kind of searching as a searcher and just skimming through the things that I want to know. But really what I came to this page to find out is, should I take the supplement? And, uh, you know, I can make a decision. I've got a summary here that the ingredients work together, but it still doesn't tell me do I want to take the supplement? Uh, and so, Vlad, if I were you, what I would do is right at the top of this, put a, uh, a summary that answers the searcher's question. You know the searcher's question is they're trying to decide, should I, should I go on the supplement? And you can uh, start off with, our recommendation is that you should or you shouldn't. Now, let's look at this page. This is the one that uh, started to outrank Vlad. And I believe uh, your concern was that there might be some um, some spam techniques going on. I haven't looked at the backlink profile for this. Uh, I don't know if this content is AI generated. I'm not saying this is the best content in the world, but I wanna tell you why I think Google is promoting this above Vlad's content. So again, put myself in the shoes of this person who is just trying to do some research on this product. And what I can learn here, I, I feel like I can skim it much faster. Uh, it's a popular product, but maybe not the best. Um, so let's see here. Uh, ingredients. What does it taste like? I think that's something that's going to be important to me. Um, and here's the problem that plant-based food supplements always taste kind of unappealing. Uh, let's see. The company's worked on smoothing out the mouthfeel so that makes it taste less grassy and chalky. I know my husband really likes uh, barley greens. I cannot stand them. I don't know how he can. It's like eating grass. Uh, so this, to me, I, I can skim this. Uh, I can see customer reviews, which I think um, is helpful, although it seems to me like there's not a whole lot here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it could be. I could see how Google could find that helpful, how users could find that helpful. Um, what's in it, what does it contain, and here's the part that I think is the reason why this page is ranking well. This is what the searcher came to know. They want to know, do does this site recommend that I take the supplement? And they said, you know what, customers, this is what's important. Customers say it has a lingering uh, aftertaste. The product's not bad, but at the same time, we don't give it top marks. We think it's expensive compared to other supplements. And we think that cramming 75 ingredients into a product is overkill. It's not the best greens product for those on a budget. We recommend you choose one of our better choices. Now we can argue, uh, you know, perhaps those better choices are ones with bigger affiliate programs. I don't know the reasoning behind Behind this, but it seems to me that this gets the searcher to what they're looking for faster. So of course, this is just spot checking a couple of examples, and it may not be exactly right. But the more I look, and I've looked at many, many examples of content that's done well with the September core update and the May core update uh, as well, um, and, and compared it to content that is uh, suffering. And by far, uh, this is the thing that I see the most is that the content that is promoted by Google is the most helpful. I think it's possible, I'm gonna get into some theory here, that the helpful content update, so we know the helpful content update uh, finished rolling out um, and then the weekend after, uh, like two days later, Google rolled out the September core update. Uh, Google told us that the helpful content update introduced a new classifier that can be used as a signal and that it's driven by machine learning. Well, I think that what it's doing is it's finding all sorts of aspects of a page that could make it helpful or unhelpful. And some of that could be whether uh, content is concisely summarized uh, you know, I, I, I do believe that it's possible to determine that with AI. Uh, some of it can be whether content is substantial. Uh, some of it may be whether uh, there's a table of contents, whether there are images. I think there are many, many things that could be measured. And then Google uses machine learning to create an algorithm that weighs, uh, you know, these different factors uh, to present sites that are the most helpful for, for searchers. And so when you combine that with the algorithms that look at EAT and also with just general relevancy algorithms that we're used to from Google, uh, I think this is a whole new way uh, that Google can assess sites. The more that they get better at machine learning, the more advances that they make in artificial intelligence, the more we're going to be seeing uh, that they get better at this type of thing. 
As SEOs, our goal should be to thoroughly understand user intent, not just is this a transactional query versus an informational query, but really is a searcher, what are they trying to accomplish? I want to leave you with this clip from Frederick Debu from Bing, where this is over two years ago, where he's talking about the importance of understanding user intent and how SEOs are going to need to change their strategies from being keyword driven to intent driven. Hi everyone, uh, this is Frederic Dubu from Bing, uh, here to talk about some of the cool stuff we are looking forward to in 2020. So if you look at 2018, 2019, lots of evolution in the field of deep learning, natural language processing. Uh, Google announced recently they integrated their BERT language model in search results. And what that means for everyone is search engines are shifting from keywords to intent at an accelerating pace. So if you imagine a few years ago, we were mostly based on keywords, then we are a keyword-based search engine with a little bit of intent sprinkled on, and what we are looking forward to in 2020 is that search engines are going to be primarily intent-based. So we'll understand the core intent better, we'll understand what the documents mean better, and we'll be able to do better matches. For you in the SEO community, what that means is that some of the current practices around cured research are probably going to become slowly obsolete and you'll need to switch to intent research uh, as a practice. So this is super important. 2020 is the year where search engines are shifting to intent primarily. I think the more that we can learn about meeting searcher intent, the more we can practice doing that, the more we can study whether our competitors better meet searcher intent, better meet the needs of searchers, the better. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, a little bit of a different one for me to do a, a dive into a theory that I have. Um, I, You know, I've been quite booked recently, but uh, I also realized that there's a real need to look at pages in this way. So I am going to be coming up with some solutions where we're going to be doing some group calls with uh, my newsletter subscribers, perhaps, um, where we can look at content that's been hit by the core update and uh, come together as a group to decide how would a quality rater look at this? How would this content be seen as more helpful to searchers? Uh, and I think uh, if we can do more and more of that, we'll get a really good sense as a group of um, what type of content it is that Google is liking to promote these days with these algorithms. Uh, if you are interested in hiring me to book a strategy session to go through your site and how you could better meet the needs of searchers, you can reach me at mariehaines.com slash contact. And uh, as always, I'm selling my book on the Quality Raiders Guidelines. It's $20 now, uh, marked down from $99 because I'm coming out with a new version, which is going to talk about my process in analyzing sites and determining uh, how to improve after core update hits. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I wish you the best of luck with your rankings.